so Elvin, if you listen to Elvin with Train on a live recording from about 63, like if you listen to the live recording Afro Blue Impressions, which is a live album that Pablo released from Train 63 European tour, and then listen to Elvin with Train in 1965, like on One Up, One Down, the live recording that came out on Impulse from the half note, and then listen to this. I think this is Elvin playing more in that 63 style. There's a big difference between Elvin with Train in 63 and Elvin with Train in 65. 65 is more avant-garde. It's more, it's a bit more, it's all always intense, but it's a little more, I don't want to say bashing, but it's, 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 you know, they've turned it up to 11. So this is less point. free, more Yeah, a little pocket. more bebop. A more little bebop. more swinging, a little huh. more pocket, and a little more bebop oriented. Huh. A little more changes oriented. Um, and less sort of open forms. Although they do some of that. The, the Lighthouse era group with, you know, 70, 71, 72 with um, Dave Liebman and Steve Grossman. They do some tunes where they play open, where they sort of play without changes. But... Um, I think Elvin liked playing tunes with, with forms as well because he's really, really great at comping, at like marking forms and playing the form of the tune while he's comping and outlining that. And I think he liked to do that, maybe. And he's doing that a lot on this. Um, but what is, what is also interesting about this is they really stretch out. They take long solos. Yeah. Everybody takes long solos. But... <laughs> If you really listen to these solos and you really listen to this stuff and really kind of engage with it and pay attention and try to let yourself be focused on it and not get distracted, you'll really hear the development. It's, it's really kind of like a textbook of long solo development. Wow. Both like Joe huh. Farrell as a soloist and the rhythm section accompanying him, but also Elvin solos. Elvin takes a couple of really long solos. Yeah, these he tunes takes, go for, an, some of them go for the entire side. Yeah, yeah, well the first tune, Keiko's Birthday March, is 21 minutes long. And it's just one tune, and a, a lot of that is Elvin solo. Elvin takes probably about a 10 minute drum solo on this. And it really, it's fascinating to me, it is not 10 minutes of Elvin just bullshitting. It is really 10 minutes of motific development and just sound, ideas, patterns. Um, it's, really, it's really remarkable and it's, it's extremely hard to do that. You know, I can't do that. I can't take a solo for 10 minutes and make it interesting. But Elvin really could do that. And, and it's really a masterclass in that type of really long form jazz improvisation. And it's not I don't hear it as being, you know, self-indulgent. I mean, they're they're going for stuff. They're trying stuff. They're trying ideas. Maybe that's self-indulgent to some people. He's always playing the form. Right? Yeah, he's always playing the yeah. form. They're always playing the tune, and they're right. always developing. the The whole thing is development from beginning to end, mm. and I just love that about this record. And I think it's something you could, as a musician, you can really dig into this stuff and learn from it. Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love this record, man. I mean, I've what, they they released the first track on Tidal and Kobuz, like they released it, you know, digitally for streaming um, a couple of months before this came out. So I was able to just dig into that one track for a while and really listen to it over and over again. And then they released a second track about a month before it came out, and I did the same thing. And it was nice to actually process it a bit that way. Um, and not yeah. trying to not trying to dig into the entire three right. LP set. Right, it's a lot from of the, from the, the three beginning. LP set, which I've misplaced. The third LP, but um, so it's most of Elvin's all his stuff on Blue Note. They're more mm -hmm. concise, shorter tunes or tunes. Yeah, Even yeah. Stuff on Impulse, Dear John C. They're tunes. Oh yeah, I forgot about Dear John that's C. A that's record. a great record. That Joe is Farrell a great too. record. No, no, no. That's uh, Charlie Mariano. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. That's not Joe Farrell. Oh, that's yeah. a great record. Yeah, I don't know if Joe Farrell maybe wasn't even in New York at that point. Does I, he stretch out on any other um, live situations, Elvin going forward? Uh, yeah, I would say on the Live at the Lighthouse record, which is a really another a very famous record, um, recorded in 1972, and and for a lot of people that's kind of the pinnacle of Elvin's uh, solo output. And they haven't reissued that yet, have they? They've done the Lee Morgan, but they haven't done the Elvin yet. No, they haven't. I mean, it's it's on 
the complete thing is on the um, mosaic box set that they did on Elvin um, about 15 or 20 years ago. There's a great mosaic box set, the complete Blue Note recordings of Elvin Jones. Yeah, I have that here somewhere. Oh man, that's one of my. That's great. That's one of my prized possessions. I agree. I've spent so and much funny, time with that. I had with done that a review set. of something where I complained that um, you know, Blue Note was only released like reissued Mr. Jones, which is kind of weird. And I think yeah. they do the ultimate, which is great. They haven't done the <coughs> ultimate. They, they did they, one other title. The the um, <coughs> the first his first record as a leader on Blue Note, putting it together, right, uh, was released on Music Matters. Oh, and that's with a puzzle. Kind of yeah, title. yeah, and right. that's a fantastic reissue. That's a really great sounding version. That's actually the only version I have of that on LP. Um, but it sounds really, really great. I have an original pressing of The Ultimate, which is a second record, which I think is also great. Maybe they'll do that as a tone poet at some point. And you mentioned that photo is from the, the album uh, the Ornette Coleman session. That, oh, the one in the line, too, yeah. Where he's really taking, I mean, I think he's taken out on those records. And it's yeah. unusual, a lot of it here, those guys hear him. Is it Jimmy Garrison with Ornette Coleman? Yeah, that's yeah. That's wild. It is, it yeah. is. And that's an unusual record. That's a, that's a much more avant-garde record than Elvin was really doing at that time period. But he sounds fantastic. He sounds fantastic playing sort of this in-between time and not time um, that works so well for Ornette. And um, yeah, I, I really like those records a lot. Um, speaking of the photos, the, the um, there was some confusion actually uh, I remember online some people making comments about this picture. So the picture they used on the cover and also on the back cover is actually from a little later. So as I mentioned before, this live recording is from July of 67. But this photo, I believe, is actually from a, a concert in Paris in 1972. He's got a seven, those are 70s clothes. Those are 70s clothes, you know, he's got for the sure. As it looks like in the, and, the turtleneck. And it is, yeah. And also, Drum geeks will notice that this is one of his bigger Gretsch kits. This is a kit with two rack toms, two floor toms, and a bass oh. drum. Now, on the Pookie's recording, he's very clearly just using a single rack tom, one floor tom, bass drum, snare drum. He's still no, using, using a smaller kit. drums. No, well, yeah, I mean, he's using a 12, a 14, and 18. Mm -hmm. And that's what he used until about 72, actually, right around the time this photo was taken, was right when he started using an additional rack tom, so 12 and 13. And then um, initially he was using a 14 and a 16 as floor toms, but then he, he quickly started using bigger floor toms. He was using a 16 and an 18. I don't know why he went to bigger floor toms, but that's what he did from kind of the mid-70s on. Mm. Yeah. What records would you, uh, of Elvin would you like to see Blue Note reissue next? I know there's polycurrents. There's like five well, they are. I think them. they are doing polycurrents. Oh. I think that's a rumored tone poet for this coming year, which is a great... That's a great album. Um, Pepper Adams it sounds amazing on that record. Um, I would like to see them do sort of a high quality tone poet version of the Live of the Lighthouse stuff for sure. Maybe a complete, something like what they did with, with uh, the Lee Morgan, a complete Lighthouse box set on, on LP and CD that would have, you know, everything that was recorded. Because the original LP is, you know, it's a two disc set, it's a, it's a two fur, but it's still it's not the full gig it's it's still only about you know maybe two-thirds of the gig or something um i would love to see that but i don't know if the market is there i mean maybe if yeah. this sells well enough they'll they'll know that there's um, to find out. there are a lot yeah. of sort of eclectic there's that uh elvin is on the mountain record with Jan oh Hammer. that's a cool record there's yeah a bunch of weird yeah. eclectic elvin records he did a record with oregon you know that the yeah <laughs> I've never heard that actually. I've never I, seen that. I, yeah, I, I remember. Oh, it's on Vanguard. That's right. Yeah, yeah, oh, right. right. It's right. On, I used to have that. Yeah. Yeah, wow. I've never heard that record actually. Huh. Which is, you know, I, I, I don't have everything. I have everything Elvin recorded in the '60s. He made I, a lot I of fall records. off a little bit. He did. I fall off a little bit when you get into the '70s. Actually, yeah, that one in the store which Roland prints on guitar, and they're all wearing like winter clothes. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. they have an Elvin like on a suitcase because he's way taller than yeah, everybody else. Yeah. In the photo. That's a great period for him, though. And uh, Roland Prince was a fantastic guitar player. Um, actually, I shouldn't say was. I don't know if he's still with us. Oh, actually, I don't, I don't know. I don't know much about him, but he's he's a wonderful guitar player. Well, excellent, Paul. I think we've covered it all. Is there anything we're missing? Uh, we could talk about digital versus LP if you oh, want. Oh, that's, that's an interesting comparison you did in your own system. Talk about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I um, I have the LP. I bought the LP, um, but I also uh, have streamed it a lot. I've listened to it on Cobuzz and Tidal. Um, so I thought so it would be interesting. Your Audi's headphones? 
Yeah, so I, like really I thought it headphones. would be yeah, I thought it would be interesting to compare um, and do a little A B switching back and forth between the L P and the Koba's high res stream. So um, I listened to that uh, on my system. So my, my turntable is a Rega RP6. Uh, I have a Rega Exact cartridge, which is their high-end moving magnet. Um, that goes into a Graham Slee uh, Gram Amp 2 SE phono stage. And my digital setup is a, a Chord Cutest DAC. And um, I actually listened to, to do this AB, I actually used headphones because my most sort of transparent and revealing, you know, listening option, um, my speakers are uh, Kef LS50s, you have which great are, they're great speakers, yeah. but if I really want to hear some subtle differences between something, I'll actually use my Odyssey LCD5 And your wife probably headphones. likes that. Yeah, yeah, she was actually <laughs> busy working uh, this afternoon when I was doing this comparison, so it was better to do it with headphones. So what were the comparison, um, what did it sound like? Almost you? identical. Huh. Yeah, really, really, really close. I, I really couldn't hear much discernible difference between the two of them. Um, it, there is a difference, it's really just the difference between whatever my DAC sounds like and whatever my, you know, whatever coloration my cartridge may be bringing to things. It really sounded like the source was identical on both. Like, wow. like they really, when they did the LPs, they just, they made it sound like the source, which I think is great. I, it doesn't sound like they mastered it to be anything other than what the tapes sound right. like. And, and you know, and, since they did it just now, this is basically a new record, they used yeah. the exact same uh, tapes to do the vinyl and the, and the rip, I guess. And I think that's great. I think that, well, it you know, it gives, it gives us the opportunity to really know what our gear sounds like. And I think that's useful for audio files. But I also think it's good, just, it's good value. If somebody can't afford the LP or somebody doesn't have a good LP setup, they can buy the CD and play it and get a high quality product, a high quality experience. So I, I think that's kind of cool too. But yeah, interestingly, I didn't hear, really didn't hear any difference. And there are other recordings where I compare a digital version versus an LP and there are big differences. Uh, so I don't think it's necessarily just in my system. Mm. Great. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for uh, for picking your own brain. Yeah, thank you, Ken. <laughs> it's always great I'll, to get, I'm, I'm get always your intake on it. Yeah, I'm always happy to talk about Elvin. He is absolutely in my top three favorite drummers of all time. I love Elvin Jones. I cannot state strongly enough how much love I have for this man and how much I think that he is just such an incredible genius and such a monumental and important artist and um, listening to him brings me so much joy so I'm always happy to talk about him and I think that everybody should listen to Elvin Jones as much as possible thanks Paul <laughs>